I know it's going to be a tough time for them coming up here soon. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Philippians 3 with me tonight, please. The apostle addresses the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter number 3 and verse 1. Philippians 3 and verse 1. The apostle said, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. That I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more than follows his pedigree. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Father, bless your word. In your holy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. The apostle lays out a very compelling argument of the third chapter of Philippians as it relates to your justification by faith, your relationship with the Lord. It's built not upon who you are and what you've accomplished or where you came from, but it's built completely upon what Christ Jesus did for you. It is, the, uh, it is, it is Satan's tactic to try to muddle that or, or uh, hide it or confuse it in your life. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit to unveil to our hearts just what Christ accomplished when he went to the cross. The apostle tells you in verse number two, he gives three categories to be aware of. He said, dogs, evil workers, and concision. In the book of Titus, the apostle Paul's talking to uh, Titus, as you know, which was with him through many of his journeys. And it, to Titus, he says, the Cretans are slow bellies. And what he means by that is that as a people, as a group of people, they are definitely giving, given over to sloth. In other words, uh, the lust of the flesh. Uh, their God is their belly. And the Apostle Paul said even one of their own prophets testified to that fact. And he said, uh, so when he wrote to the book of Titus, he rebuked them and told, Timothy, told Titus to rebuke them for that because they came out of that kind of culture. And they're in the book of Titus. So you've got to remember there are those who live only for the flesh for the gratification of the flesh. And if there's no pleasure in it, like a hedonistic thing, if there's no pleasure in it, then you won't find them around. And then there are those who are the evil workers. And these are they, who, the ones who, for whatever reason they might have, twist the scriptures, pervert them and distort them, and, uh, and present a lie as the truth. As, for example, he said in second, uh, the book of Second Thessalonians, when they came to you, they preached another Jesus or another spirit. And so forth. In the concision, he didn't even give them the, the uh, respect of calling them the circumcision. He called them the concision, which of course is reference to the Jews who tried to drag the Old Testament law of Moses into the faith of Christ and make a mixture out of it, an adulteration of the truth. And you and I both know that Christianity or our faith in Christ is not a work to over Judaism, but it is the revelation of Judaism. It's what the true faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob pointed to. It's the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures that talked about that prophet that should come. There's certainly nothing wrong with the Old Testament Jewish faith, but the problem is that they cannot drag it over into the faith of Christ and work the two together and create some kind of a fabricated, contrived, man-made faith. You don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to keep the law of Moses. You don't need any of these things. You need the grace of God with the blood of Christ applied to you. And that comes only by faith. So the apostle set the stage for what he's going to say to them in Philippians chapter number 3. In verse number 5, he gives his pedigree. And all of these things in his pedigree, you can look at them. He says, for example, of the tribe of Benjamin. This was the one who was born of Rachel. This is the one who Jacob loved. Remember, Rachel had two sons. What was the other one? 
Exactly, the one who was sold off into Egyptian slavery. So he said, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, dearly beloved of Jacob. And Hebrew of the Hebrews, what does that mean? That means I'm not a proselyte. That means that not one of my parents was a Jew and the other one not. Both of my parents, in other words, are Hebrews. I'm a Hebrew, pedigree, full, uh, full, uh, completely uh, full-born as a Hebrew. As touching the law of Pharisee. Could be no stricter sect, could be no more a straight line, could no more conservative than a Pharisee. That's what I was, he said. Not a Sadducee. A Sadducee denied the resurrection, denied the spiritual law, denied angels, denied the res and denied, and obviously denied that, uh, that God was a spirit in the sense that we understand him. Now what, a sad, what a Sadducee really and truly believed is a hard matter to work out. I guess he's, he's, he's like your modern day liberal who just borrows from religion and makes it a socialistic thing and, you know, pulls some kind of a do-good tenet from it and, and then makes it uh, all about this earth and this life. But the Apostle Paul said, I was a Pharisee. I believed in the resurrection, believed in angels, believed in spirits, and all the things that went with that. But he said, as, 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 uh, as he continues, concerning zeal persecuting the church. In other words, he said, I was dedicated to what I believed. Absolutely. You may be absolutely dedicated, but you could be absolutely wrong. Dedication, sincerity is no mark of the truth. And there are many that are dedicated and sincere as they can be in what they believe, but they're still wrong. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. I preached a message about that a few weeks back. The righteousness of the law he compares to the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. Look at verse number 9. The last phrase, the righteousness which is of God by faith. What righteousness? The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he compared that righteousness of the Son of God with the righteousness that he understood by the law, he said it's dung. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So he tells us, he said, what things I counted gain, what things were gain, I counted loss, for they're no good to me. Doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. It would be a good study for you because I've been on this now for the last few days. To go through the New Testament where it talks about knowledge of Christ, revelation of God. The places in the New Testament where it talks about how God has revealed himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'll put a thought in your mind tonight. Just take this and think about it as you leave out of this place tonight. Can't you by searching find out God? No. There is no way that you can find him out. The only thing that we'll ever know about God is what he reveals to us. The revelation that God gives to his creatures is a progressive thing. God does not reveal to us all at one time. We can't handle it. How much do we know of him now? We know what we've experienced experientially, what the Bible says. My friend, that's only the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more that we'll know of him. But a New Testament, when it talks about the revelation of Christ, the revelation that you might, in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul talks about that, that you might be increased in the knowledge of him, the wisdom of God, in the revelation of Christ Jesus. These are the things that Paul said are so important. Why are they important? Because the more you know of God, the more you understand your place in creation and your place before him and what he's done for you. It's ignorance of God that condemns the Gentile. The Bible says they know not God. They're ignorant of him. They walk in darkness. They're blind. Their foolish heart is blinded. They have no idea who he is. They carve a piece of stone. They cut a piece of wood. They raise a stone to the unknown God. They're superstitious. They told, Paul was in the book of Acts. They called one of them Mercurius and the other, I forget the other name, the things that had fallen down from heaven. Full of superstition, full of ignorance. And that exactly where the Gentile is to this very day. The reason you know the truth of God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is because you have the word of the living God. Amen. And let me say to this one more time, the oracles of God, Romans chapter number nine, were given to the Jew. Don't ever turn to a Gentile philosopher, to a Gentile sage or, or, or guru for knowledge and wisdom of God. They have none. There's all kinds of esoteric, all kinds of mystical, mysterious religions out there that profess to take you to a higher plane, a higher learning, a higher understanding of God. And all it is, is Satanism repackaged in a different manner for whatever culture it belongs to. The only way you can ever approach God and know him is through that blessed book right there. Amen. That's the truth of God. Hallelujah to God. Amen. <laughs>
He said, I count them all but loss for the knowledge of Christ Jesus, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. That's an under, that, that is maturity. That's growth. Not having mine own righteousness, this is the righteousness of a legalist. This is when someone looks at himself and can't really, and begins to understand, oh, how great I am, how I've attained, how achievement I, what I have, how good I am. I've won this, I've, I have this approval, I belong to this group. No, that's garbage. The Apostle Paul says, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith. And that's another study to make in the New Testament, the ways that faith are the perspectives the Bible gives you on faith in the New Testament and compare that to the Old Testament. And you'll see a big movement toward uh, understanding when it comes to faith. He said that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. My, what a thing to talk about fellowship of sufferings and the power of his resurrection. You realize when the apostle said, I came to the church not with wisdom of man's words, not in excellency of words. I didn't come to impress anyone. He said, I came to you in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. The church does not have power. It doesn't have the truth. It may have the truth intellectually, but it's not living by it in the heart. Once you begin to practice what that Bible teaches about truth in the heart, truth in the inward part, truth in the inward man, that truth will bring forth power in your life. Amen. Power. So the Bible tells us here in verse number 11, if by any means I might attain the resurrection of the dead, not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I'm apprehended of Christ, Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to, app to have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. Watch how he uses this analogy. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He's running a race again. More than once in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul appeals to a race and applies it to the Christian life. That's an analogy, a race, a race. And a race always has a finish line, a goal. Where are you going? And so the Apostle Paul tells you in 2 Timothy, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He finished the race. The race is run. Paid his dues. Time was up. And it was time to go on to be with the Lord. You're in the race now. Don't drop out. Don't fall out. They're counting on you. They're counting on you. Amen. And probably, if the, if probably the best analogy of a race, as far as the Christian life is concerned, would be a relay race, where a baton is passed from one to the other. You rem you've seen them, I'm sure you have. A relay race, where a baton, one starts, and then he'll run 100 yards, or 100 whatever it is, one lap around the field, and hand it to the next man, and to the next man, to the next man. Well, he's got to get it from the one before him before he can leave. He can't run off. You cannot run away until you get that baton. If you don't have the baton, you can beat everybody out there, but you're still lost. And we've had it handed to us. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter number 11. It says plainly in Hebrews chapter number 11 that the, that the witness, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race that is set before us. Hebrews chapter number 12. Amen. Again, the apostle uses the analogy. You're in the race. Run it. Run it to the end. And God Almighty is going to bless you for it. So he said, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ, Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. The word perfect has nothing to do with sinless perfection. It has to do with maturity. Be thus minded. Notice how the mind is affected. And in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. See the revelation? Nevertheless, whereto we have attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me. Mark them which walk as so so as you have us for an example, for many walk of whom I have told you often, now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Notice what the apostle said. He didn't say the enemies of Christ. He said the enemies of the cross of Christ. It is the apostle Paul who spelled out the definition of what the cross means in the Christian's life. The cross means that I am crucified to the world and the world to me. And so when the apostle says here, the enemies of the cross of Christ, they want Christ, but they don't want the crucifixion. They don't want the separation. They don't want, this, uh, they don't want the discipleship. They don't want to give up the world. They want both. They want to straddle the fence. 
and they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. You can't have it both ways. And if you're born again, you won't want it both ways. Now notice carefully verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation, that's our manner of life. That's our life. That's what we're about, what we live for and where we live. Our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice what he does here. He talks about the life which I now live in the flesh. Look at the comparison. Look at, the, look at what he says. Who shall change our vile body. Notice that he makes it very clear. The body's not going to heaven. It's a vile body. That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. According to the working whereby he's able even to subdue all things into himself. And if you'll go in 1 Corinthians 15, you'll see exactly what the apostle's talking about. When he talks about this body, this body of corruption, sown in corruption, raised in incorruption, sown mortal, raised immortal, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown a terrestrial body, raised a celestial body, sown a mortal body or a earthly body, and raised a spiritual body. This is all that he uses in 1 Corinthians 15, and he does that in 1 Corinthians 15 because some of them questioned the resurrection of the dead, and he said, why say some among you there is no resurrection of the dead? And he said, Thou fool, don't you understand? It's not that which is sown that is raised. You sow one thing, something else is raised. The only body that was ever sown dead and raised identically the same, no change whatsoever, was the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The same body that went in the tomb came out three days later. Yeah. Amen. Say, so why so, preacher? Why didn't his body corrupt? Because his blood was the blood of God. Yeah. Because he wasn't born with original sin. Because he took sin in his body, deposited where it belonged. Sin has no power over that one who is perfect and pure. And he was perfect and pure. So sin could never dom dom have dominion over him. It could never lock him. It could never hold him in its grasp. Because he didn't owe it anything. He had never committed a sin. And then that's why he could break the power of it three days later. The, sin, the power of sin is death. The strength of sin is death. That's what the Bible says. And it could not hold him. On the third day, he arose from the dead. Hallelujah to God. And so now 2,000 years later, we come in here and we do this Lord's Supper, or communion. If you want to call it communion, that's a good word for it. And it represents the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a vast array of differences in the way people approach this. There are those who take it every time they meet. They have, they have the Lord's Supper every time they meet. They'll get no criticism out of me because the Bible does not tell you how often to do it. So when it comes to that, leave it alone. If they want to take the Lord's Supper every time they meet, that's their business. On the other hand, there are those who take it in mass and they think that they're taking the literal body and the literal blood of Christ. And that by doing that, that they are receiving Christ and receiving him into, into, them, into themselves as their Savior. And by doing that, then that is part of a sacrament. Of a sacrament has to do with you being saved. The Catholic Church has many sacraments. And it has to do with your salvation. Let me say this to you tonight, folks. This will not become the body of Christ and it will not become the blood of Christ. But what it will become to you, if you look at it the way the Scripture teaches, it will be a memorial. This do as often as you do it. Do it in remembrance of me. It will remind you that his body was shed died and his blood was shed for us and he broke his body he won who's the he's the one who broke the first bread and distributed it and then he handed them the wine and they celebrated the lord's supper the lord's table we'll do that tonight but let me say this to you tonight god wants you to do this but he wants you to be right when you do it he tells them plainly, for some of them come and they take it for the wrong reason, the wrong attitude, and the wrong manner. And for that reason, some are sickly and some are even dead. They're gone. So what do I do, preacher? No, you don't do anything. It's what Christ has done. You let you take hold of his finished work for you and plead to the, plead to the Father, Lord God, I'm a sinner, but Jesus paid my sin debt. Lord God, I am not worthy, but he is worthy. 
and I have received him as my Lord Jesus Christ and as the Savior of my soul. And tonight, once again, I take this opportunity to confess him openly, publicly, before the Father and before the world, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior of my soul. I believe in him. I've received him. And you only receive him one time. You know you've received him. You know he's your Lord. You know he's your God. Then you can rejoice in doing this. If an unsaved man takes the Lord's Supper and does it in ignorance, he does it in ignorance, and he's, it's all in ignorance. And that's about as far as it'll go, in ignorance. God makes a vast distinction between that one who knows what he's doing and that one who doesn't know what he's doing. It's presumptuous sin that we talk about in the Old Testament. Willful ignorance. It's what you should know and don't know that God holds you accountable for. If you come to the Lord's table with a cavalier attitude, like it really doesn't make that much difference. I mean, after all, that's just some bread and grape juice. What's the big deal? The big deal is that you're mocking God because he sees what we're doing tonight. He wants you to get your heart right. Remember, as often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. It causes us to stop and remember. It is a special occasion to remember what we're here for, to set everything in order, to put it in its rightful place. We're not here tonight because of the Baptist church or the Presbyterian or the Lutheran or the Catholic or the Pentecostal. We're here tonight because of Christ. I would be saved if it wasn't for him. I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for him. He forgave me of all my stinking, rotten, dirty, low-down sins. He forgave me of them. And it took that body and that blood to do it. So when I do this tonight, I will be thankful. I'll be thankful. And I give you an opportunity tonight if you want to pray, if you want to talk to the Lord, if you want to do anything. You can pray where you are. You can come down here and pray. It doesn't make any difference. We have an altar that they don't know anything about that serve the tabernacle. The altar that we have is not made with stones carved out with a man's hand. God said, don't put a rock. He said, don't lift up your hand against a stone. If you do, you've polluted it. If you're going to take a stone and make an altar out of it, use it exactly the way you find it. God made it that way. And so what does that mean? That means that you just come the way you are. The way you are. The way you are. We're lively stones. Lively stones, every one of us. So if you want to pray tonight, let's pray, and then we'll take the Lord's Supper. We'll take it more often than we did in the past. I think, it's, I think we need to. Like I said to you before, those that take it every time they meet, I won't argue with them about it. I don't see any, I don't, I don't in my heart have any conviction to feel like that we need to take the Lord's Supper every time we meet. I have no conviction about that. If the Bible ever convicted me of that, then it'd be a different story entirely. But I do, I do, I do believe we need to take it frequently. I wanted to do it at Easter because I thought it would be a good time at Easter time to take the Lord's Supper along with the fact that it was a Passover. But the folks that do our uh, get this together, uh, Sister Beverly Crane was sick, real sick, and had been sick for a long time. And you know the infirmity of the flesh, there's nothing you can do about that. And so we, we put it off until we could do it today. And I'm just glad that, they're, that she's feeling better and the family's able to do it now and get it ready for us tonight. That's the liberty you have. You see what I mean? Didn't have to do it then. We have that liberty. We do it tonight. That's the liberty you have in Christ Jesus. God understands things like that. He fully understands them. If you want to pray, you can pray.